Now I want to ask you if you have a Bible and New Testament with you this evening or are able to look on at a neighbor's, then please turn to the letter to the Hebrews and keep your finger in the place there as we this evening will be moving around the letter to the Hebrews and it will help you if you're able to turn up the various different passages in this letter that I want us to look at together. The whole letter, by and large, focuses on our theme of this evening, Jesus Christ, the priest. Like most people in my generation, I had a well-meaning aunt. I blame her nowadays for a good deal. But one of the things my well-meaning aunt did at Christmas time was always to provide me with a piece of improving literature. When I was a little boy, of course, and was scarcely able to make out the letters, she would go to the bookstore and buy me a pop-up picture book. They were always, in my case, pop-up picture books of improving literature, as it used to be called not pop-up picture books of the kind of things I was really interested in, but junior versions, pictorial versions of the kind of book that my well-meaning aunt thought that in later life I ought to be reading. And unfortunately, the school teachers thought I ought to be reading those books as well, far too early to enjoy Jane Austen and the like. The marvelous thing about these pop-up picture books, whoever thought about them, was that you didn't need many words. You opened the book up, usually sideways, and suddenly the whole thing came to life. And it was in this way that the people who put these pop-up picture books together wanted to convey great stories to very young readers, even to youngsters like myself, who could scarcely read at all. You could follow the storyline simply by working your way through these three-dimensional pictures of the people who were part of the novel, part of the plot. Of course, when you were older, you were supposed to put these pop-up picture books aside, uh, give them to somebody else, uh, send them to charity, and you were supposed to read the real thing. You knew the story of great expectations when you were tiny. You were expected to plow your way through Dickens when you grew older. The pop-up picture books were meant not for grown-ups, but for children. And I've often thought that that is an excellent illustration of the way in which God deals with His people through the days of the Old Testament and into the days of the New Testament. Hebrews, in fact, later on, will speak about the days of the Old Testament as the days of the spiritual immaturity of God's people, when they were not ready, not fully prepared for the whole story that God was going to tell. And yet the marvelous thing is, But even in those days of spiritual infancy, with their comparatively less understanding of God's ways and God's purposes and God's will in Jesus Christ, nevertheless, God gave to His people in these Old Testament days vivid pictures of what He meant to do. And we are talking in these three Sundays about some of these vivid pictures. And they were vivid. They were three-dimensional pictures. And they were pictures with which Old Testament believers were constantly surrounded. There was the picture of the man who was called the prophet. A picture that would be fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the living Word of God. And there was the picture of the king, a picture that also would be fulfilled in Jesus, the King who would reign over His people. And there was perhaps the central picture in the Old Testament, in many ways the most significant picture, the one that is described in most detail, the picture 
of the priest who offered sacrifices day in and day out, so that if you lived particularly in Jerusalem, each day of your life you would be conscious, not least from the smell of the slaughtered animals, that the high priest or one of the other priests was about his business. And this that lay at the very heart of the religious experience of God's people in the Old Testament was supremely meant to be a picture of what God would fully and finally do when He sent His Son, the Messiah, the prophet and the priest and the king, in order to be the real Savior of men and women. And indeed, in this passage that we've read in Hebrews chapter 2, you will notice that the author thinks that, in a sense, this was the central purpose of Jesus' incarnation. In verse 17, Jesus had to be made like His brothers in every way, in order that He might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that He might make atonement for the sins of the people. And it's obvious from the way in which the author goes on, particularly at the beginning of chapter 3, that this idea that Jesus is our great high priest is the central theme of his whole letter. And he urges these Christians to fix their gaze upon Jesus and to think about him in this particular way almost as though he is saying, if you really want to understand what Jesus has done for you, then you've got to come back with me to these pictures in the Old Testament. You've got to live for a little while in this pop-up picture book in order to see the different strands that are woven together by God in His mercy in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ to equip him and qualify him to be the Savior of sinners. And so, in very strong language, in chapter 3, verse 1, he turns to those to whom he is writing and says, Therefore, holy brothers, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the one God has sent to be the high priest whom we confess. And the whole of his letter is an aid, a help to enable you to fix your thoughts on Jesus. May I say again, because I think I've said this on more than one occasion before, I believe that this is one of the most difficult things for 21st century Christians to do, to fix our thoughts upon Jesus. We find ourselves surrounded by a myriad of different voices calling us to fix our thoughts on a wide variety of things. But as I've often said to you, the real test of where I am spiritually is the answer to this question, what do I tend to think about? What do I tend to fix my thoughts on when I've got nothing else to fix them on? And if the answer to that question is not actually, of course, Jesus Christ, then you will know, you will know how important it is to hear this exhortation. Fix your thoughts upon Christ, the apostle and the high priest of your calling. Of course, one of the reasons we find that so difficult is because we know him so little. It is only as we get to know Him better that we find our hearts and our minds drawn out more and more so that they are fixed upon Jesus Christ. And that is why the author of this letter, anonymous as he is, that is why the author of this letter so patiently in the chapters that follow teaches us about Jesus Christ, the high priest, in order to help us to fix our minds upon Him. There is so much to learn. He goes on to say that later on. He says, I've just got so much to teach you about this. 
and some of the things that he wants to teach them emerge in the chapters that follow. There are four things that I want to draw out from his teaching this evening that will help us to understand what it means for Jesus to be our high priest and help us too to fix our minds and our gaze upon him. The first of these is Jesus' qualifications. His qualifications to be our high priest. In chapter 5, verse 1, the writer says, Every high priest is elected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. And he is qualified to do this. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. Here in chapter 2, verse 14 and 17, he had made a similar point. Notice particularly in verse 17, he had to be made like his brothers, that is, his brother human beings, in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God in order to represent us before God, this is what he's saying, in order to represent us before God, Jesus has to belong to our community. In order to serve us before God, Jesus has got, first of all, to become one of us, which he does by sharing our humanity in his incarnation. But the author is anxious to unravel what that means. What did it mean for Jesus to qualify to serve on our behalf before the face and in the presence of God? Well, it meant three things. Number one, he had to come to share in our weakness. That's the point that's made in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 2. In order to deal gently with those who are ignorant or going astray, he himself must be subject to weakness. And later on in the same chapter, he gives us an illustration of that. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he is probably thinking here particularly about the Garden of Gethsemane, he offered up prayers and petitions. Now, prayers and petitions are themselves expressions of weakness. If you can do it yourself, you don't pray about it. You do it. The very fact that you are praying about something means that you are calling out to God out of your own sense of weakness in order that He may come and He may help you. So the very fact that Jesus prayed these petitions in this way, as He did in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. The very fact that he prayed was an expression of his dependence upon God and a confession of his own human weakness. But not only so, it's not only a confession of his weakness, but it's a recognition of how tremendously weak our Lord Jesus Christ felt. He prayed with strong cries loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. Have you ever done that? Felt your need so deeply that it has not been possible for you to pray to God at the level, the vocal level you ordinarily pray? You know what it is to be in such a situation of perplexity and weakness that you've gone into the fields or into the park, some quiet place, and you have shouted to God as though the heavens were brass and as though God Himself were deaf and silent. And with loud cries, you've called upon God. Do not think you are alone. Jesus prayed with loud cries. Do you know what it is to feel broken and helpless at the end of your tether so emotionally in an upheaval that the tears 
do not cease to flow. Then, says the author of this letter, Jesus was there before you. He prayed with loud cries and with tears out of his deep sense of weakness. He knew what it was to fear death. And particularly the death he was going to die. Martin Luther put it this way. He said, no man ever feared death like this man. Because he was so deeply conscious of his weakness. But says the author, he not only shares our weakness, he shares our temptations. He came into the world and he was tempted. Verse 18 of chapter 2, he himself suffered when he was tempted. And this is what qualifies him to help those who are being tempted. And this is so important to him that he repeats it in chapter 4. He says, we have a high priest who can sympathize with us in our weakness because he has been tempted in every way, just as we are yet was without sin. I think most Christians find that almost impossible to believe. Most of us, when we are tempted, feel we're the only ones who have ever been tempted this way. And sometimes we have such an unbiblical view of the incarnation, the taking flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ, that somehow or another we think that temptations bounced off Him like water off a duck's back. Not so. He was tempted and tested, and in those temptations he suffered. In every way, at every point, just as you are. The fact that Hebrews itself insists that he was absolutely sinless, that when Satan came to tempt him in the wilderness, there was nothing in him that would give Satan leverage over him, should not mislead us into thinking that therefore resisting temptation was a matter that Jesus could simply brush off. You know what it is, even in your own frailty, the more you resist temptation, the stronger the temptation sometimes can come. And here was Jesus in the wilderness, faced with one of the most devilish, subtle temptations to gain what God had sent him into the world for, the kingdoms of this world, by a way that would bypass the horrors and the pain and the agony and the sense of dereliction and desolation, he would suffer in the cross. And because he was flesh and blood, because he loved and valued life, because he had some sense of that darkness into which he would enter and cry, God, if there's some other way, find that other way. How powerful that temptation must have been to him. He shares our weakness. He shares our temptations. You can run through the gospel and you ought to, from time to time, read the gospels with different kinds of questions in your mind. Read the Gospels with this question in your mind. What do all these different experiences of Jesus tell me about the way in which he was tested and tempted? He came to share our weakness. He came to share our temptations. And he came to share our sufferings. The author says that in his temptations he suffered. But the author also makes clear that he suffered in every conceivable way. Verse 10, in bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting, this is chapter 2, that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. God designed his life in such a way that there was built in suffering in order that he might be qualified and equipped to bring to heaven's glory those who suffer, to bind himself to them in every experience of their lives, including their suffering. 
in order that he might be a fit leader, a pioneer, one who could be trusted to lead them into heaven's glory. And the author in different places makes it clear that every dimension of painful human experience that there is, Jesus tasted. And you see this again as you read through the Gospels. Every aspect of human experience is covered by the suffering that Jesus must have experienced from his childhood through to his mature humanity. Yes, he knew what it was to be despised in his own community. He knew what it was for people to talk behind his back about his own legitimacy. He knew what it was to be misunderstood by his parents. He probably knew relatively early what it meant to have death take the father figure in his house. He knew what it was to be despised by the members of his own family circle. He knew what it was to be poor. He knew what it was to be cold, to be tired, to be hungry. He knew what it was to be bereaved. We're told in John chapter 11, when Jesus comes to the tomb of Lazarus, that he broke down. That's what the words mean. It means he broke down and wept. His whole inner being in a great state of emotional turmoil. The language that describes his experience in the Garden of Gethsemane is almost beyond description in the way in which it speaks of the painful mental suffering which the Lord Jesus Christ endured as he contemplated the horror of experiencing a sense of great divine desolation. There is no kind of suffering that you and I experience, mental or physical, which Jesus did not taste. And it's because of all this, because He shares our weakness, shares our temptations, shares our sufferings when He comes into the world, that the author of Hebrews tells us to fix our minds upon Jesus, the great high priest, because He is exactly the Savior that you need. You need a Savior who understands you, to whom you're able to say, you know what I'm going through. And Jesus, says the author, is able to represent us before God because He's one of us, and He's qualified to be our great high priest. But He speaks not only about the qualifications of the high priest, He focuses on the sacrifice of the high priest. The ministry of the high priest was, of course, many-sided, but central to the high priest's task, as to the task of all the priests, was to make sacrifices for the sins of the people. Again, chapter 5, verse 1, underlines this. Every high priest is selected from among men, and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. And this is a keynote that struck again and again in this letter. The central task of the high priest is to make sacrifices for the sins of the people. But the genius of the author of this letter to the Hebrews is that he recognizes that all those sacrifices, all those times when the priests went into the temple and sacrificed the animals and brought the blood and spread the blood before God and prayed that the sins of the people would be forgiven, the author recognizes that all that was just a picture. All that was just a hint of the way in which God would fully and finally deal with the sins of the people. That all of that ritual in the Old Testament was actually like a drama. It was like a drama that was supposed to point you 
to somebody who was still to come, in whom the meaning of the drama would find its ultimate fulfillment. And he points this out in a number of places. For example, in chapter 9, in verses 6 to 10, he says, When all the arrangements had been made, that is, in the tabernacle, when all the arrangements had been made, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. Then the high priest entered the inner room once a year on the great day of atonement, Yom Kippur, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had yet not been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. This is an illustration for the present time. You see his point? All that ritual that's described in the Old Testament, the priests... And then on the great day of atonement, the high priest entering into the holiest place of all for the sins of the people. All of that was simply an acted parable pointing towards something far greater. He puts it in the same way in chapter 10, verse 1. The law, by which he means the whole sacrificial system, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming not the realities themselves. He uses the illustration of a shadow that a man casts. You are walking along the road, you come to a corner, and because of the way the sun is shining, you can tell that somebody is about to come round the corner because his shadow goes before him as the sun shines from behind him. But you don't confuse the shadow and the man. The shadow, the shadow is cast upon the ground because the man is real and he's round the corner. But the shadow is there only as an anticipation of the person who will soon round that corner and whom you will meet face to face. And the author is saying in this way, we understand all that took place in the temple and before that in the tabernacle in the Old Testament times. None of these things was the real thing, but they were like shadows cast on the ground by the real thing, Jesus Christ. They all pointed forwards towards Him. And this writer, at least, is convinced, it seems, that an Old Testament believer would have been able to understand that. But as the Old Testament believer thought about what was going on, he realized, God is teaching me something here about the way in which he's going to bring the forgiveness of sins to me. But it's not by these animal sacrifices, and it's not by the work of these priests. He makes this very clear in different ways. Chapter 5, verse 3, he says, these priests were sinful. And so they needed to make sacrifices for their own sins. Well, if they needed sacrifices for their own sins, they were scarcely equipped to be saviors of the people. But by contrast, he says, we have a high priest who is holy, undefiled, sinless, And because he does not need any sacrifice for his own sins, he is able to make sacrifice for the sins of others. Chapter 7, verse 26, such a high priest meets our need. You see, these earlier priests, they didn't really meet our needs. They couldn't because they were sinners themselves. But we have a high priest who meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins. You see, the priests were sinful. So none of them could be the real high priest who would bring us to God. 
We need a sinless high priest to come to a sinless holy God. Then there was something else. The author of Hebrews believed an Old Testament believer would have been able to work out by faith. And that is that not only was the high priest simply a symbol, but the sacrifices themselves must just be symbols. Chapter 10, verses 1 to 4, when he's told us that the law is only a shadow of the good things that are to come, not the realities themselves, he goes on to say in verse 4, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Now you see the point he's making. He is saying the offering of an animal sacrifice can scarcely be an adequate offering in the place of a man or a woman who has sinned against God. The only appropriate sacrifice for a man or a woman would be not the blood of bulls and goats, but, yes, human sacrifice, human sacrifice. And this he makes clear in chapter 7, verse 27. Unlike the other high priests, he doesn't need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins when he offered himself. That's what we were singing about, isn't it? Priest and victim, Jesus dies. The inadequacy of the Old Testament high priestly ministry was seen in the defects of the high priest and in the fact that that sinful high priest could bring into the presence of God only the offering of the blood of bulls and goats that could never take away sin. Yes, all that could symbolize the way in which God would take away sin, but it wasn't an adequate sacrifice for the sins of human beings. And the glory of this high priest is that he becomes both priest and victim. But on the cross of Calvary, he comes into the presence of God, into the holiest place of all, and there on that cross, which becomes an altar in the presence of God, he pours out his own precious lifeblood as a sacrifice for the sins of his people. So the priests were inadequate because they were sinful. The sacrifices were inadequate because they were simply animal sacrifices. And the offerings could never really work lastingly because they needed to be made time and time and time again. Verse 27 of chapter 7, the other high priests says the author, need to offer sacrifices day after day. And again later on, he says the same thing. He says day after day, these sacrifices were made. And all this, I know it's very remote to us, but it, was, it must have been very real to anybody who had lived in Jerusalem where every day you would see the priestly family going into the temple, where you would know who the high priest was and he would move around the city, where the animals would have been brought in, particularly around the time of the Day of Atonement and, of course, around the time of the Passover. Thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of animals being taken into the temple. They say that particularly around those great high days of sacrifice, the stench of blood in Jerusalem was almost unbearable. So that not only visually, but in, in every kind of sensory way, a believer who lived in Jerusalem would be conscious of the fact that the only way into the presence of God was by the offering of these sacrifices. But as he thought about it, he would realize 
if these sacrifices need to be repeated day after day after day after day, year after year after year, then these sacrifices can't really be taking away my sins. To use Paul's language, they simply cover them over. God says, I'll cover it over for the moment. I'll cover it over today and then tomorrow and then tomorrow and next year and next year and next year. But the Old Testament believer would have seen this can't be the real thing. But by contrast, says the author, Jesus Christ sacrifices himself once for all. Not just once for all in terms of him doing it for the sins of the world, but once for all time, once and for all in that sense. He doesn't offer sacrifices day by day, chapter 7, verse 27. He sacrificed for their sins once for all. Not just one for all, once for all. All. And he has this marvelous way of describing this. He says in chapter 10, verse 11, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, what did he do? He sat down. He's drawing, of course, on the words of the 110th Psalm. But he wants to make this point in a very visual way. Here is the priest. It's Monday morning. He makes the sacrifice. He stands at the altar. What happens on Tuesday? He stands at the altar. He makes the sacrifice. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and so on. Every day of the year. Every day of atonement. The priest stands at the altar and he keeps standing because his work isn't finished. He's got to go on doing it day by day. But not Jesus. Not Jesus. When he had made his one sacrifice that was sufficient for the sins of his people for all time, not just for today, but for all time, what did he do? Well, he sat down at the right hand of God, his very posture and indication that all his work is finished. Isn't that great to know? Our forefathers used to speak about the finished work of Christ. And it's great to know that for this reason, that he has done everything to bring the forgiveness of my sins once and for all. No going back. No turning back with God. He has accepted this sacrifice and He will not turn back. Payment God will not twice demand. First at my bleeding surety's hand and then again at mine. That's enormously liberating when you grasp it especially if you are one of those Christian believers who is constantly haunted by the memory of your sin and your failure. To know that what He has done once and for all deals with your sin in the presence of God. So that's the second thing He emphasizes. The first is the priest's qualifications. The second is the priest's sacrifice. The third, of course is the high priest's intercession. Because the task of the high priest, which, as I said, is multi-sided, was to go into the presence of God in order to make sacrifice for the sins of the people, but also, on an ongoing way, to intercede for the people, to bear the people up in the presence of God, and to pray for them. And this was most beautifully expressed in the Old Testament liturgy. Exodus chapter 28 describes the point perfectly. If you want to turn to it, do. Otherwise, just listen to 
what we find in that passage. It's headed in a rather unlikely way, the priestly garments. One of those passages that you look at the heading and you think there won't be much here. But then we're told how God said to Moses that the priestly garments were to be very carefully woven and formed because the priestly garments themselves were meant to be part of the drama by which God would describe salvation. Not just the action of the priests, but the very clothing of the priests sent a message. The way we dress sometimes does send messages, doesn't it? And the way the high priest dressed was meant to send a message to the people. Middle of that passage, Moses is told by God that he is to take two onyx stones, Exodus 28, 9, and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel in the order of their birth, six names on one stone and the remaining six on the other, the twelve tribes of Israel. Engrave the names of the sons of Israel in the two stones the way a gem cutter engraves a seal. Then mount the stones in gold filigree settings, fasten them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod, the cloak that the high priest wore, as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. Aaron, who was the first high priest, is to bear the names on his shoulders as a memorial before the Lord. It was a picture that the high priest, as he served the Lord and as he served the people before the Lord, was there carrying, as it were, the weight of all of the people into the very presence of God, bringing them on his shoulders. And then as the passage goes on, we're told that the high priest was to have a breastplate fashioned. And this breastplate was to have 12 precious stones on it. Verse 17, in four rows. In the first row, ruby, topaz, beryl. In the second row, turquoise, sapphire, emerald. In the third row, jacinth, agate, and amethyst. In the fourth row, chrysolite, onyx, and jasper. There are to be 12 stones, one for each of the names of the sons of Israel, each engraved like a seal with the name of one of the 12 tribes. Then cast your eye down to verse 29. Whenever Aaron enters the holy place, he will bear the names of the sons of Israel over his heart on the breastplate of decision as a continuing memorial before the Lord. What a picture. What a picture of the intercession, the mediation that the high priest was to make between the people and God as he went into the presence of God in this way. He was carrying the people upon his shoulders. He was wearing the people, as it were, upon his heart. And this, of course, is intended to be for us a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. He goes into the presence of God, we're told by the author of Hebrews, to make intercession for us. Hebrews chapter 7. There have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he is a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Isn't that some picture of Jesus? Jesus with the names of his people engraven on his shoulders. Jesus with the names of his people engraven on his heart. These high priests went into the tabernacle, into the temple. Jesus, says the author, has gone right into heaven and lives forever to make intercession for his people. Christ, chapter 9, verse 24, did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered into heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. 
a marvelous pop-up picture this priestly ministry was of Jesus. But there's a great contrast. The priests died, and one by one they had to be replaced. But this high priest never dies. He lives forever in the power of an indestructible life. The priests went into a man-made tabernacle, a man-made temple. But Christ has gone into the very presence of God, and there he lives forever to make intercession for his people.